Chapter 26. The ward got up very early next morning. He made a determined effort the moment he woke up, threw off the great bearskin rug under which he slept, and plunged his body into the biting air. He dressed furiously, trembling, skipping about to keep warm, and hissing blue breaths to himself as if he were grooming a horse. He broke the ice in a basin and dipped his face in it with a grimace like eating something sour, said, ah, and rubbed his stinging cheeks vigorously with a towel. Then he felt quite warm again and scampered off to the emergency kennels to watch the king's huntsman making his last arrangements. Master William Twitty turned out in daylight to be a shriveled, harassed-looking man with an expression of deep melancholy on his face. All his life he had been forced to pursue various animals for the royal table, and, when he had caught them, to cut them up into the various joints. He was more than half a butcher. He had to know what parts the hounds should eat, and what parts should be given to his various assistants. He had to cut everything up handsomely, leaving two vertebrae on the tail to make the chine look attractive and almost ever since he could remember, he had been either pursuing a heart or cutting it up into joints. He was not particularly fond of doing this. The hearts and hinds in their herds, the boars in their singulars, the skulks of foxes, the richesses of martens, the bevies of roes, the keeps of badgers, and the routs of wolves all came to him more or less as something which you either skinned or flayed and then took home to the cook. You could talk to him about os and argos, suet and grease, crotes, fumets, and fions, but he only looked polite. He knew that you were shooing off your knowledge of these words, which were to him a business. You could talk about a mighty boar, which had nearly slashed you last winter, but he only stared at you with his distant eyes. He had been slashed sixteen times by mighty boars, and his legs had white wheels of shiny flesh that stretched right up to his ribs. While you talked, he got on with whatever part of his profession he had in hand. There was only one thing which could move Master William Twitty. Summer or winter, snow or shine, he was running or galloping after boars and hearts, and all the time his soul was somewhere else. Mention a hare to Master Twitty, and although he would still go on galloping after the wretched heart which seemed to be his destiny, he would gallop with one eye over his shoulder, yearning for puss. It was the only thing he ever talked about. He was always being sent to one castle or another, all over England, and when he was there, the local servants would fet him and keep his glass filled and ask him about his greatest hunts. He would answer distractedly in monosyllables, but if anybody mentioned a husk of hairs, he was all attention, and then he would thump his glass upon the table and discourse upon the marvels of this astonishing beast declaring that you could never blow a meanie for it, because the same hair could at one time be male and another time female, while it carried grease or crotade and nod, which things no beast in earth did except it. Wart watched the great man in silence for some time, then went indoors to see if there was any hope of breakfast. He found that there was, for the whole castle was suffering from the same sort of nervous excitement which had got him out of bed so early, and even Merlin had dressed himself in a pair of running shorts to see the fun. Boar hunting was fun. It was nothing like badger digging or covert shooting or fox hunting today. Perhaps the nearest thing to it would be ferreting for rabbits, except that you used dogs instead of ferrets had a boar that quite easily might kill you instead of a rabbit, and carried a boar spear upon which your life depended instead of a gun. They did not usually hunt the boar on horseback. Perhaps the reason for this was that the boar season happened in the two winter months, when the old English snow would be liable to ball in your horse's hoofs and render galloping too dangerous. 
The result was that you were yourself on foot, armed only with steel against an adversary who weighed a good deal more than you did, and who could unseen you from the nave to the chaps and set your head upon his battlements. There was only one rule in boar hunting. It was hold on. If the boar charged you, you had to drop on one knee and present your boar spear in his direction. You held the butt of it with your right hand on the ground to take the shock while you stretched your left arm to its fullest extent and held the spear tightly with it as high up as possible. You kept the point towards the charging boar. The spear was as sharp as a razor and it had a cross piece about 18 inches away from the point. This cross piece, or horizontal bar, prevented the spear from going more than 18 inches into his chest. Without the cross piece, a charging boar would have been capable of rushing right up the spear, even if it did go through him, and getting at you like that. But with the cross piece, he was held away from you at a spear's length, with 18 inches of steel inside him. It was in this situation that you had to hold on. He weighed between ten and twenty score, and his one object in life was to heave and weave and sidestep until he could get at you like a champ. Till he could get at you and champ you into chops, while your one object was not to let go of the spear clasped tight under your arm until somebody had come to finish him off. If only you could keep hold of your end of the spear while the other end was stuck in him, you knew that there was at least a spear length between you, however much he ran you round the forest. You may be able to understand, if you think this over, why all the sportsmen of the castle got up early for the Boxing Day meet and ate their breakfast with a certain amount of suppressed feeling. Ah! Oh! said Sir Grumore, gnawing a pork chop which he held in his fingers. Down a dime for breakfast, eh? <clears throat> yes, I am, said the wart. Fine hunting morning, said Sir Grumore. Got your spear sharp, eh? Yes, I have, thank you, said the wart. He went over to the, to the sideboard to get a chop for himself. Come on, Pellinor, said Sir Ector. Have a few of these chickens. You're eating nothing this morning. King Pellinor said, I don't think I will. Thank, thank you all the same. I don't think I feel quite the thing this morning. What? Sir Grumor took his nose out of his chops and inquired sharply. Nerves? Oh, no, cried King Pellinor. Oh, no, really, not that. What I think I must have taken something last night that disagreed with me. Nonsense, my dear fellow, said Sir Ector. Here, you just have a few chickens to keep your strength up. He helped the unfortunate king to two or three capons, and the latter sat down miserably at the end of the table, trying to swallow down a few bits of them. Need them, said Sir Grumor meaningly. For the end of the day, I dare say. Do you think so? asked King Pellinor anxiously. No, so, said Sir Grumor, and winked at his host. The wart, however, noticed that both Sir Ector and Sir Grumor were eating with rather exaggerated gusto. He did not feel himself that he could manage more than one chop. And as for Kay, he had stayed away from the breakfast room altogether. When breakfast was over and Master Twitty had been consulted, the Boxing Day cavalcade moved off to the meet. Perhaps the hounds would have seemed rather a mixed pack to the master of the corn today. They were half a dozen black and white alluants, which looked like greyhounds with the heads of bull terriers, or worse. These, which were the proper hounds for boars, wore muzzles on account of their ferocity. The gaze hounds of which there were, 
the gaze hounds, of which there were two taken just in case, were in reality nothing but greyhounds, according to modern language, while the limers were a sort of mixture between the bloodhound and the red setter of today. The latter had collars on and were led with straps. The brachets were just like beagles and trotted along with the master in the way that beagles always have trotted, and a charming way it is. With the hounds went the foot people. Merlin, in his running shorts, looked rather like Lord Baden Powell, only, of course, the latter has not got a beard. Sir Ector was dressed in sensible leather clothes. It was not considered sporting to hunt in armor, and he walked beside Master Twitty with that bothered and important expression which has always been worn by masters of hounds. Sir Grummore, just behind, was puffing rather and asking everybody whether they had sharpened their spears. King Pellinore had dropped back right among the villagers, feeling that there was safety in numbers. And all the villagers were there, every male soul on the estate from Hob the Ostranger down to Old Watt with no nose, all carrying spears or pitchforks or old side blades or stout poles. Even some of the young women who were courting had come out with baskets of provisions for their men. It was a regular Boxing Day meet. At the edge of the forest, the last follower joined up. He was a tall and distinguished looking person dressed in green, and he carried a seven foot bow. Good morning, master, he said pleasantly to Sir Ector. Ah, yes, said Sir Ector. Yes, yes, good morning, eh? Yes, good morning. Then he led the gentleman in green aside and said in a loud whisper that could be heard by everybody, For heaven's sake, my dear fellow, do be careful. This is the king's own huntsman, and those two other chaps are King Pellinore and Sir Grummore. Now do be a good chap, my dear fellow, and don't say anything controversial. Will you, old boy? There's a good chap. Certainly I won't, said the green man reassuringly, but I think you had better introduce me to them. <clears throat> Sir Ector blushed deeply and called out, Ah, Grummel, come over here a minute, will you? I want to introduce a friend of mine, old chap, a chap called Wood, old chap, Wood, with a W, you know, not an H. Yes, and this is King Pellinore. Master Wood, King Pellinore. <clears throat> Hail, said King Pellinore, who had not quite got out of the habit when nervous. How do, said Sir Grummore. No relation to Robin Hood, I suppose. <clears throat> oh, not in the least, interrupted Sir Ector hastily. Double U, double O, D. You know, look, the stuff they make furniture out of. Furniture, you know, and spears, and, well, spears, and, you know, and furniture. <clears throat> How do you do? said Robin. Hell, said King Pellinore. Well, said Sir Grummel, it's funny you should both wear green. <clears throat> yes, it is funny, isn't it? said Sir Ector anxiously. He wears it in mourning for an aunt of his, who died by falling out of a tree. <clears throat> Beg pardon? Oh, I'm sure, said Sir Grummore, grieved at having touched upon this tender subject, and all was well. <clears throat> now then, Mr. Wood, said Sir Ector, when he had recovered himself, where shall we go for our first draw? As soon as the question had been put, Master Twitty was fetched into the conversation and a brief confabulation followed in which all sorts of technical terms like lessons were bandied about. Then there was a long walk in the wintry forest and the fun began. Wart had lost the rather panicky feeling which had taken hold of his stomach when he was breaking his fast. The exercise and the snow wind had breathed him, 
that his eyes sparkled almost as brilliantly as the frost crystals in the white winter sunlight, and his blood raced with the excitement of the chase. He watched the limmerer, who held the two bloodhound dogs on their leashes, and saw the dogs straining more and more as the boar's lair was approached. He saw how, one by one, and ending with the gaze hounds, who did not hunt by scent, the various hounds became uneasy and began to whimper with desire. He noticed Robin pause and pick up some lessons, which he handed to Master Twitty, and then the whole cavalcade came to a halt. They had reached a dangerous spot. Boar hunting was like cub hunting to this extent, that the boar was attempted to be held up. The object of the hunt was to kill him as quickly as possible, Wart took up his position in the circle round the monster's lair and knelt down on one knee in the snow with the handle of his spear couched on the ground ready for emergencies. He felt the hush which fell upon the company and saw Master Twitty wave silently to the limerer to uncouple his hounds. The two limers plunged immediately into the covert which the hunters surrounded. They ran mute. There were five long minutes during which nothing happened. The hearts beat thunderously in the circle, and a small vein on the side of each neck throbbed in harmony with each heart. The heads turned quickly from side to side as each man assured himself of his neighbors, and the breath of life steamed away on the north wind most sweetly as each realized how beautiful life was, which a reeking tusk might, in a few seconds, rape away from one or another of them if things went wrong. The boar did not this time express his fury with his voice. There was no uproar in the covert or yelping from the limers. Only about a hundred yards away from the wharf, there was suddenly a black creature standing on the edge of the clearing. It did not seem to be a boar particularly, not in the first second that it stood there. It had come too quickly to appear to be anything. It was charging Sir Grumor before the wart had recognized what it was. The black thing rushed over the white snow, throwing up little puffs of it. Sir Grumor, also looking black against the snow, turned a quick somersault in a rather large puff. A kind of grunt, but no noise of falling, came clearly on the north wind, and then the boar was gone. When it was gone, but not before, the wart knew certain things about it, things which he had not had time to notice while the boar was there. He remembered the rank mane of bristles standing upright on its razor back, one flash of a sour tush, the staring ribs, the head held low, and a red flame from a piggy eye. Sir Grumor got up, dusting snow out of himself unhurt, blaming the spear. A few drops of blood were to be seen frothing on the white earth. Master Twitty put his horn to his lips. The Aliwans were uncoupled as the exciting notes of the mini began to ring through the forest, and then the whole scene began to move. The limers, which had reared the boar, the proper word for dislodging, were allowed to pursue him to make them keen on their work. The brooches gave musical tongue the Aliwants galloped bang through the drifts. Everybody began to shout and run. Avoy! Avoy! cried the foot people. Chahu! Chahu! Avant, sir! Avant! Swef! Swef! cried Master Twitty anxiously. No, no, gentlemen! Give the hound room, if you please! <coughs> hi! Hey! Hi! Hey! cried King Pellinor. Did anybody see which way he went? What an exciting day, what? Da sa se avant, da sa avant, da sa avant. Hold hard, Pellinor, cried Sir Ector. Where hounds and where hounds? Can't catch him yourself, you know. Ele hot, ele, e hot. And ele ho, echoed the foot people. Ele ho the trees. Holly ho! murmured the distant snowdrifts as heavy branches, disturbed by the vibration, slid noiselessly 
puffs of sparkling powder onto the muffled earth. The wart found himself running with Master Twitty. It was like beagling in a way, except that it was beagling in a forest where it was sometimes difficult even to move. Everything depended on the music of the hounds and the various notes which the huntsman could blow to tell where he was and what he was doing. Without these, the whole field would have been lost in two minutes, and even with them, about half of it was lost in three. Wart stuck to Twitty like a burr. He could move as quickly as the huntsman, because, although the latter possessed the experience of a lifetime, he himself was smaller to get through obstacles, and had, moreover, been taught by Maid Marian. He noticed that Robin kept up too. But soon the grunting of Sir Ector and the bine of King Pellinor was left behind. Sir Grummore had given in early, having had most of the breath knocked out of him by the boar, and stood far in the rear, declaring that his spear could no longer be quite sharp. Kay had stayed with him, so that he should not get lost. The foot people had been early mislaid because they did not understand the notes of the horde. Merlin had torn his breeches and stopped to try and mend them again by magic. The sergeant had thrown out his chest so far in crying tally-ho and telling everybody which way they ought to run that he had soon lost all sense of place and was leading a disconsolate party of villagers in Indian file at the double with knees up in the wrong direction. Hob was still in the running. Twelve. Twerf, panted the huntsman again, addressing the wart as if he had been a hound. Not so fast, master. They're going off the line. Even as he spoke, wart noticed that the hound music was weaker and more querulous. Stop, said Robin, or we may tumble over him. The music died away. Twerf, twerf, shouted master Twitty at the top of his voice. Stow her here. Oh, how? Oh, how? He swung his baldric in front of him, and lifting the horn to his lips, began to blow a reachy. There was a single note from one of the limers. Oh, rear! cried the huntsman. The limer's note grew in confidence, faltered, then rose to the full bay. Oh, rear! Hear how, Emmy! Hark to Beaumont the Valiant! Oh, moy! Oh, moy! All Oh, oh, oh! The limer was taken up by the tenor bells of the broches. Of the, broches. the noise grew to a crescendo of excitement as the bloodthirsty thunder of the aluants pealed through the lesser notes. They have him, said Twitty briefly, and the three humans began to run again, while the huntsman blew encouragement with <laughs> In a small bushment, the grimly boar stood at bay. He had got his hindquarters into the nook of a tree blown down by a gale in an impregnable position. He stood on the defensive with his upper jaw writhed back in a snarl. The blood of Sir Grummore's gash welled fatly among the bristles of his shoulder and down his leg, while the foam of his chops dropped on the blushing snow and melted it. His small eyes darted in every direction. The hound stood round, yelling at his hateful mask, and Beaumont, with his back broken, writhed at his feet. He paid no further attention to the living hound, for it could do no harm. He was black, flaming, and bloody. So ho! said the huntsman softly. He advanced upon the murderer with his spear held out in front of him and the hounds, encouraged by their master, stepped forward with him pace by pace. The scene changed as suddenly as a house of cards falling down. The boar was not at bay any more, but charging Master Twitty. As it charged, the aluants closed in, seizing it fiercely by shoulder or throat or leg, so that what surged down on the huntsman was not one boar, but a bundle of animals. He dared not use his spear for fear of hurting the dogs. The bundle rolled forward remorselessly, as if pounds did not impede it at all. Twitty began to reverse his spear. He 
deep the charge off with its butt end, but even as he reversed it, the tussle was upon him. He sprang back, tripped over a root, and the battle closed on top. The wart pranced round the edge, waving his own spear in agony. There was nowhere he dared to thrust it in. Robin dropped his spear, drew his falchion in the same movement, stepped into the huddle of snarls, and calmly picked an alluant up by the leg. The dog did not let go. There was space where its body had been. Into this space, the falchion went slowly, once, twice, thrice. The whole superstructure stumbled, recovered itself, stumbled again, and sank down ponderously on its left side. The hunt was over. Master William Twitty drew one leg slowly from under the boar, stood up, took hold of his knee with his right hand, moved it inquiringly in various directions, nodded to himself, and stretched his back straight. Then he picked up his spear without saying anything and limped over towards Beaumont. He knelt down beside him and took his head on his lap. He stroked Beaumont's head and said, Hark, Beaumont, softly, Beaumont, mon ami, oye a Beaumont, the valiant, swift, la dose Beaumont, swift, swift. Beaumont licked his hand but could not wag his tail. The huntsman nodded to Robin, who was standing behind and held the hound's eyes with his own. He said, Good dog, Beaumont the Valiant. Sleep now, old friend, Beaumont. Good old dog. Then Robin's falchion left Beaumont out of this world, to run free with Orion and to roll among the stars. The wart did not like to watch Master Twitty for a moment or two. The strange little leathery man stood up without saying anything and whipped the hounds off the corpse of the boar as he was accustomed to do. He put his horn to his lips and blew the four long notes of the mort without a quaver, but he was blowing the notes for something else. And he startled the wart because he seemed to be crying. The mort brought most of the stragglers up in due time. Bob was there already, and Sir Ector came up next, whacking the brambles aside with his boar spear, puffing importantly, and shouting, Well done, Twitty! Splendid hunt, Barry! That's the way to chase a beast of venery, I will say. What does he weigh? The others dribbled in by batches. King Pellinore bounding along and crying out, Tally ho! Tally ho! Tally ho! In ignorance, the hunt was done. When informed of this fact, he stopped and said, Holly ho, what? In a feeble voice, then relapsed into silence. Even the sergeant's Indian file arrived in the inn, still doubling with knees up, and were halted in the clearing while the sergeant explained to them with great satisfaction that if it had not been for him, all would have been lost. Merlin appeared holding up his running shorts, having failed in his magic. Sir Grumor came stumping along with Kay, saying that it had been one of the finest points he had ever seen run, although he had not seen it, and then the butcher's business of the undoing was preceded with a pace. Over this, there was a bit of excitement. King Pellinore, who had really been scarcely himself all day, made the fatal mistake of asking when the hounds were going to be given their quarry. Now, as everybody knows, a quarry is a reward of entrails, etc., which is given to the hounds on the hide of the dead beast, Sir La Queer. And as everybody knows, a slain boar is not skinned. It is disemboweled, with the hide being taken off, and since there can be no hide, there can be no quarry. We all know that the hounds are rewarded with a fuel, a mixture of bowels and bread cooked over a fire, and of course, poor King Pellinore had used the wrong word. So, King Pellinore's trousers were taken down amid loud huzzas, and the protesting monarch 
was bent over the dead beast and given a hearty smack with a sword blade by Sir Ector. King Pellinor then said, I do you think you are all a lot of beastly cads? And wandered off mumbling into the forest. The boar was undone, the hounds rewarded, and the foot people, standing about in chattering groups because they would have got wet if they had sat down in the snow, ate the provisions which the young women had brought in baskets. A small barrel of wine, which had been thoughtfully provided by Sir Ector, was broached, and a good drink was had by all. The boar's feet were tied together, a pole was slipped between its legs, and two men hoisted it upon their shoulders. William Twitty stood back and courteously blew the cream. It was at this moment that King Pellinore reappeared. Even before he came into view, they could hear him crashing in the undergrowth and calling out, I say, I say, come here at once. A most dreadful thing has happened. He appeared dramatically upon the edge of the clearing, just as a disturbed branch, whose burden was too heavy, emptied a couple of hundred weight of snow upon his head. King Pellinore paid no attention. He climbed out of the snow heap as if he had not noticed it, still calling out, I say, I say, what is it, King Pellinore? shouted Sir Ector. <clears throat> oh, come quick, cried the king, and turning round distracted, he, he vanished again into the forest. Is he all right? inquired Sir Ector. Do you suppose? <clears throat> Excitable character, said Sir Grumor. Very. Better follow up and see what he's doing. The procession moved off sedately in King Pellinore's direction, following his erratic course by the fresh tracks in the snow. The spectacle which they came across was one for which they were not prepared. In the middle of a dead gorse bush, King Pellinore was sitting, with the tears streaming down his face. In his lap there was an enormous snake's head, which he was patting. At the other end of the snake's head there was a long, lean, yellow body with spots on it. At the end of the body there were some lion's legs, which ended in the slots of a heart. There, there, King Pellinor was saying. I didn't mean to leave you all together. It was only because I wanted to sleep in a feather bed just for a bit. I was coming back, honestly. I was. Oh, please don't die, beast, and leave me without any of you mitts. When he saw Sir Ector, the king took command of the situation. Desperation had given him authority. Now then, Hector, he exclaimed, don't stand there like a ninny. Push that barrel of wine along at once. They brought the barrel and poured out a generous top for the questing beast. Poor creature, said King Pellinor indignantly. Just pined away, positively pined away, just because there was nobody to take an interest in it. Oh, I could have stayed all that while with Sir Grummore, never given my old beast a thought I really don't know. Look at its ribs, I asked you, like the hoops of a barrel, and lying out in the snow all by itself, almost without the will to live. Come on, beast, you see if you can't get down another gulp of this, it will do you good. Mollocking about in a feather bed, added the remorseful monarch, glaring at Sir Grumor, like a, like a kidney. But how did you, how did you find it? faltered Sir Grumor. I happened on it, and small thanks to you, running about like a lot of nincompoops and smacking each other with swords. I happened on it in this gorse bush here with snow all over its poor back and tears in its eyes and nobody to care for it in the wide world. It's what comes of not leading a regular life. Before it was all right, we got up at the same time and quested for regular hours and went to bed at half past 10. Now look at it. 
it's gone to pieces all together. And it'll be your fault if it dies. You and your hummocky bed. <clears throat> but Eleanor, said Sir Grimoire, shut your mouth, replied the king at once. Don't stand there bleeding like a fool, man. Do something. Catch another pole so that we can carry old Gladys and Holton. Now then, Hector, haven't you got any sense? We must just carry him home and put him in front of the kitchen fire. Send somebody on to make some bread and milk. And you, Twitty, or whatever you choose to call yourself, stop fiddling with that trumpet of yours and run ahead and get some blankets warm. When we get home, concluded King Pelinor, the first thing will to be given will be to give it a nourishing meal. And then, if it's all right in the morning, I'll give it a couple of hours start. And then, hey-ho for the old life once again. What about that, Nelson? hey? You'll take the high road and I'll take the low road, what? Come along, Robin Hood, or whoever you are. You may think I don't know, but I do. Stop leaning on your bow with that look of negligent woodcraft. Pull yourself together, man. Get that muscle-bound sergeant to help you carry her. Now then, lift her easy. Come along, you chuckleheads, and don't, and mind you don't trip. Other beds and quarry, indeed. A lot of childish nonsense. Go on, advance. Proceed, step forward, march. Feather brains, I call it. That's what I do. And as for you, Grummore, added the king, even after he had concluded, you can just roll yourself up in your feather bed and stifle in it. <laughs>